Well, today we're uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, will of God, and it's no uh, subtle thing that um, that I'm wearing green. I mean, it is Super Bowl Sunday, right? I'm kind of for the underdog. I wonder what, uh, you think it's God's will that maybe we choose one team over another? Is that dangerous, Jimmy? Dangerous. Yeah, it probably is dangerous, uh, especially when it comes to football. Um, when I was growing up, and you've heard me talk about this some before, uh, our farm was just about five miles from the Fort Cobb Lake. And as a matter of fact, where you turn off the highway, to go east to go to the lake, it was called Fort Cobb Lake Road. And um, and so, you know, we spent a lot of time over there. I was a kid, went over there with my dad and granddad and great uncles, and I'd go fishing with them, and we'd go camping over there and skiing. And and then when I got older, then I'd go over there, and, um, and then I'd go over there and uh, and do stuff. And uh, we'll not go too deep into that, but. So it was a, it was kind of a natural thing to go over there for us. And when I was in high school, um, I think it was my junior year, some of my buddies were over there uh, just goofing around, and the lake had gone down. Uh, they'd taken some water out of it, and so there was a dry, you know, shoreline, and then there was the bank where the lake had been. And and so for some reason, they had. Uh, decided they were going to dig a cave back into the bank, and so they did. And uh, there were three of them. My good friend Jerry Bolin, and Jerry and I did a lot of things together. And you probably heard me talk about him. That uh, he was a real strong Christian guy, and uh, and we were together for most everything. And there were some things that I did, and other things uh, he was with us that he didn't do. You know what I'm saying? And he was always this witness to a lot of us about being a Christian. And uh, and so Jerry was kind of in the front, and then it was Lynn. Uh, Lynn Campbell was kind of in the middle, and then Dale, this friend of ours, who has come to church here some. Uh, he's retired now from soil conservation. But anyway, Dale was kind of in the, on the outside in the mouth of the cave, kind of taking the dirt and you know putting it out. And for whatever reason, no one's sure why the thing collapsed. Dale got uh, buried some, but he was able to get out, and he was able to get uh, Lynn out. And uh, by the time he got Lynn conscious, conscious, uh, and they worked together to get Jerry out, it was too late. And uh, Jerry passed away in that tragedy, and it <clears throat> it just stunned our whole school, our whole community. Um, and really got to me personally. And so, you know, I, I guess I would ask you, as we look at this subject today, uh, was the collapse of that cave and the death of my friend God's will? Last year, in 2017, was a bad year for hurricanes. There were at least 10, with Harvey, Irma, and Maria being the worst of the 10. 434 people lost their lives in these massive storms. And it did over $316 billion worth of damage. And so the thing I would ask you is this. Were those storms God's will? I was stunned by this next thing I'm going to share uh, because I was thinking, you know, two or three weeks ago about this sermon. And I just started keeping track that since the first of the year, January the 1st, 2018, there have been 12 mass shootings in schools in the United States. 12 in January. It might be higher now, but at least 12. Last year, a mentally ill man shot up 
a music concert in Las Vegas, killing 58 people and injuring over 500. Most of us remember the incident at the First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs, Texas, where another mentally ill man shot and killed 26 worshipers from a toddler to a 77-year-old grandfather. The question I would ask you is, were these acts of violence somehow the will of God? God's will is a common phrase used too loosely by too many people. In my opinion, I got up this morning, watched some of the news, and it was used this morning on the news. Maybe people that use that phrase a lot, maybe they don't understand what to say. They find themselves in a, in a bad situation, something's happened, and it's just easy to say because they don't know what else to say. Maybe they really believe in a God that would do a monstrous thing like that. Maybe they're just looking for someone to blame or to make some sense out of things that don't make any sense. But you hear it all the time. You hear things like, oh, it's just God's will, or we can't question God's will, or there's a reason for everything. Or worst of all, we hear, and I've heard, and maybe I've been guilty of saying it early in my ministry, I don't know, I don't think so. But worst of all, maybe some people say, well, God took them because he just needed another angel. Don't say that. How can we understand God's will? There's got to be a better way, and I think there is. And, you know, Bev and I went on this trip recently, and one uh, we went by it. We didn't go in it, but uh, there's a church in London. It's just north of uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. It's called City Temple, and it's where uh, a great Methodist preacher preached for a number of years, Dr. Leslie Weatherhead, and he preached there from 1936 until 1960. He was there during World War II, and the church was actually destroyed by German bombs during the war. And in 1944, he preached a series of sermons to try to help his people and the city of London and the country of England come to, to some understanding to try to make sense out of the suffering they were going through that made no sense. And so he preached this series of sermons that became a book, and it was crazily successful. It just was an instant classic. And you've heard me talk about it before, and I thought it was time to talk about it again now. And not very rarely do I repeat things, I think. But I think this is important. This understanding of God's will flowed out of this pastor's heart because he wanted to help people understand. And Weatherhead draws the distinction between these three ideas of God's will, the intentional will of God, the circumstantial will of God, and the ultimate will of God. And so, you know, I would encourage you to jot down some notes if you're so inclined. The in and there's a place in your bulletin, by the way. The intentional will of God is what God in his love would want to happen. This is God's intention. It is the pouring out of God's goodness on the earth, on his creation. God never desires pain and suffering of his children. Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 18, verse 14, where Jesus said, It's not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost or to suffer, maybe some translations say. Matthew 18, 14. God only wants the best for us. The question of God's will often arises during times of illness, right? 
Does God cause cancer or heart attacks or any variety of debilitating illnesses? And my response is no. God's intention for each of us is to live a healthy, joyful, happy life. And Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that your life might be abundant. That's Jesus' desire for us. Jesus in his ministry, we know, healed individuals and healed multitudes of people. God's intention is for everything to be good, positive, and joyful. But it seldom works out that way, does it? There are circumstances that we encounter in life that prevent this intentional will of God from happening. That's why we understand that God has a circumstantial will. So in addition to his intentional will, he has a circumstantial will. God made the world in freedom, natural and human freedom. We are created free because to be fully human, we must be fully free. Free to love, free to believe, free to act, free to choose relationship. And so in a sense, God chooses to limit his sovereignty, his control over things, to allow freedom so that we can be in relationship with God. I mean, what kind of of relationship would it be if we had no freedom and God chose us to be in relationship? Maybe in that sense it wouldn't matter. I don't know. But he allowed us the free will to choose and to choose to be in relationship with him. I think that's genuine love in that relationship. The problem is this. Here's the problem. The problem is freedom allows us to stray away from God, doesn't it? The problem is freedom allows us sometimes to stray away from our relationships, our human relationships. Some of you know what I'm talking about. God has a will within the evil circumstances of our lives. We have the freedom to stray away from our relationship with God. We have that freedom and we sin, right? Human freedom can have tragic results. Crime, accidents, war. Creation itself is free. But the freedom of nature also sometimes has tragic results. Tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, the collapse of the earth around us. His circumstantial will is for the best possible results given the circumstances. His will is for us to respond positively and creatively against the circumstances. Here's his intention. Now we're in these circumstances. God doesn't leave us alone. His will is for us to respond positively and creatively in the set of circumstances. This is the will of God, and it's the will of God expressed for Paul in Romans 8, 28. Listen to what Paul said. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God's intention is for all things to be good. Now let me repeat that. God's intention is for all things to be good, but they're not. They're not. So within the circumstances of life, God still works for good, for God's good and our good. Think again of illness. 
God's intention, His intentional will is for us to be healthy and happy. If we get sick, the circumstances of illness call for medical treatment, right? Right? Not acquiescence to the infathomable will of God who caused the illness if we believe God caused that. If the illness is... Now listen to this. If you believe that illness is God's will, if that's your theology, then let me share this with you. If the illness that you suffer from you believe is God's will, it would be sinful to try to get help and get well from that illness, right? So if you believe that God caused that illness, then you're going to sin if you go to the doctor. Responding positively and creatively to a tragedy, an earthquake, a fire, a car wreck, a hate crime, is God's will. Even when the circumstances of tragedy were not God's will. Doing the circumstantial will of God opens up the way of God's to God's ultimate triumph in us and the final expression of God's intentional will. Y'all still with me? So finally, the will of God will be done. That's the ultimate will of God. Ultimately, God will have the victory. No circumstance in the world of suffering can ultimately keep God or God's will from happening. The real good news is that God can even use evil circumstances of life to bring about the ultimate triumph of His will. That wasn't His intent, but if that's the circumstances that's dealt, God will use those circumstances for His will to continue for our good until ultimately His will is done. And the best place to see this, I think, is the cross of Jesus. If you read the whole 11th chapter of the book of Romans, one of the things that's clear is if the the people of Israel had been obedient to God, if they'd have trusted God by faith and been obedient to God instead of disobedient, it wouldn't have been necessary for Jesus to come. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God himself coming to earth to live the life we couldn't live because of our disobedience and dying the death we should have died, taking our place, so that we could enjoy a relationship with God that he provides through the cross, Jesus. And the cross is the best example. If we had just done what God created us to do, if Adam and Eve had done what God asked them to do, it started way back there, right? Hello. Are you all looking at my green sweater? Are you thinking of the Super Bowl? Jesus was confronted with the circumstances of evil. They had rejected even Jesus and his teaching, accused him falsely of blasphemy. The cross was the only way to be faithful to the Father. In the garden, Jesus is agonizing about doing the right thing. And finally, in this time of prayer, in Luke 22, verse 42, if you're keeping notes, Jesus prays this, not my will, but your will be done. The death of Jesus and the cross allows God to win the ultimate victory of his will. All God wanted to do was save his creation, to save us. 
have been nice if we'd have listened, as I've already said, but we didn't. God used an instrument. Now listen, God used an instrument of evil. God used an instrument of punishment. God used an instrument of pain and suffering, the cross, to bring redemption and salvation to all of creation. Isn't God a great God? You know, I, you know, Scott, our, our son, he's a oncologist, and occasionally, not real often, uh, he tells me stories. And there's a lady in Little Rock who, uh, uh, she has a blog, so this is not private. This she. She's published this on her blog, Never Lose Spirit. Stacy Sells, uh, in 19, excuse me, 2010, was diagnosed with breast cancer, inflammatory breast cancer, an aggressive form, often fatal. And when she was diagnosed, she started a blog in 2010, reflecting, and she was writing at one point, reflecting on the will of God in relation to her situation. 23 years earlier, Stacy's husband had been killed by a drunk driver. He was killed three weeks after they'd given birth to their, to their daughter. She was 27 years old. Stacy, as she acknowledges now, her faith was not mature, and people would encounter her around her community, and they would keep telling her that her husband's death was part of God's will or part of God's plan. And because of those kind of comments, Stacy came, she found herself in this place of having a real faith crisis. If that was true, what they're saying, how can I believe in a God like that? One of our visitors during this time of crisis was her pastor, a Methodist pastor, James Argue, who pastored Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. He came to her house to talk to her, and she remembers him saying this to her at some point in their conversation. Stacy, I have no answers because God does not intend for terrible things like this to happen. He gave her a copy of Dr. Leslie Weatherhead's book. She read it. So 23 years after she read it, after her husband was killed, when she was diagnosed with cancer, she went and got the book back out and reread Dr. Weatherhead's book. How many of you all have read it? What? Whatever curriculum you're using in your small group or Sunday school class, my suggestion would be this. As soon as you're finished with that curriculum, get that little book, and you as a Sunday school class or a small group or individual, read that book. Discuss it with a friend. When Stacy was diagnosed with cancer 23 years after her husband was killed, she went back and read the book, and she wrote in her blog, this. God does not will us to experience the early death of a child or terminal illness. There are no master control switches or puppet strings where God is orchestrating the evil and sorrowful circumstances of life. Death and illness and natural des destruction are not what God intended for us. Instead, God hopes for his children God hopes for his children intentional will. God's hope for his children is that during sorrowful times, circumstantial will, we will seek his message of love and comfort and hope. Ultimate will, she puts in quotes. Stacy was given less than two years to live when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. That was seven and a half years ago. She has since remarried. 
Last month, she became a grandmother. She was honored by the American Cancer Society for her advocacy. And here's the question. Does all that mean that God likes Stacy better than the women who have died of breast cancer in the last seven years? We just celebrated the life of a marvelous lady from New Covenant yesterday in this place, Linda Putnam, who first came to this church in 1994, a year before I got here. And year after year, Linda volunteered in our office every Tuesday with a smile on her face and nine years ago was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I know there were days when she was in pain and when, she, when you would see her, she had a smile on her face. Does all that mean that God likes Stacy better than she likes other women who have died? Linda? We don't like to ask, be asked those questions. But my answer to you is no. I think it means that Stacy has responded in a positive way, in a creative way to the evil circumstances of her life. I think God is showing up to her through his will. She gets it. And the question is, how do we get it? How do we discern the will of God in our lives? What does God want us to do in our own circumstances? How do we know? Weatherhead, when you read his book, has several suggestions on discerning the will of God. And it almost sounds like he was a Methodist because you can almost hear John Wesley in his response when Wesley talks about the means of grace, which we probably haven't talked about far enough with you. In a nutshell, what Weatherhead says in his book is discerning the will of God. Now listen, discerning the will of God is a matter of deepening your friendship with God. Deepening your friendship with God. We talk about that around here. That's how we understand what God wants to do in our lives. When we stay close to God, we deepen our friendship with God. It's easier to understand what His will is. How do we do that? How do we increase our friendship with God? How do we deepen the relationship? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me give you just a few quick ways. One, pray. Talk to God. Pray. Two, read and study Scripture. That's why God gave us the Word of God. It's His Word. Read it. Study it. Three, worship with other Christians, in the body of Christ, worship together. Four, be accountable to one another in a mentoring relationship, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two or three, or in a small group. Have some grace-centered accountability in your relationships. Five, have conversation with Christian friends about what you're trying to discern as God's will. Six, pay attention to that inner voice in you. The conscience, the inner light, the in intuition in your heart. Listen for the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to your heart. Listen for the Holy Spirit to speak through others to you. Seven, engage in acts of mercy, service, and mission. There are all kinds of ways. This is not a comprehensive and exhaustive list. The deepening that relationship by any means available, the deepening of that relationship will make his will more apparent to you. And of course, the thing I would say is that this is more of an art than a science. There will still be times when you'll be faced with a circumstance and you've done all of these things and, and God's will will still be a mystery to you. The very context of the scripture lesson today as Paul is trying to explain why the Jews should not be left out of the covenant that God made with them, even though they have been disobedient, they have not been faithful to God, and 
Paul struggling with abandoning the Jews. And finally, he throws up his literary hands and he exclaims in the doxology of chapter 11, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. There's still a mystery in life. There will always be questions. In the end, God is bigger than our questions. That's the ultimate will. Paul concludes by saying this, To him be the glory forever. We can't understand why a friend of ours would die in a collapsed cave while playing with other friends. We can't fully understand why a man would gun down innocent people at a concert. We can't understand a number of tragedies and hardships that afflict our lives and the lives of others. It's just not something we can grasp. But we can understand that our God is a loving God, for God so loved us that he sent Jesus. God does not want to harm us, and his intention is for, is for good for us. We can understand that evil circumstances of this world in those, God wants us to respond creatively and positively so that we can turn evil into good. And God gives us the resources to do that. We can understand that God, in the end, nothing defeats God's purpose. One day we will look into his face and all the questions and heartaches and pain and frustration of life will not matter. God will be victorious.